I'm Janet Jacobson, and I am the director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and I want to welcome you back to our plenary session. I hope that all of you had excellent uh, lunchtime and afternoon sessions. I got to stop by a couple of them, and they uh, were full of energy both on the um, panels and in the audiences, and it was very encouraging. So this panel is on collaboration, direct collaboration between activists and the academy. And I have to say, um, I, Ann Pellegrini, with whom I write very often, her paper in, in the earlier session on the future of the academy was about love. And I love my job. Um, and one of the reasons that I do is because I get to work with an incredible group of people, um, the staff of the Center for Research on Women here, the provost's office uh, at Barnard College and everyone else at Barnard, and with women like the women on the panel here today. Um, these women are my collaborators and, and good friends, and we're here to talk about what's possible when we bring activists and academics together. The challenges, certainly, but also what can happen that's good, why we would want to pursue such collaborations, and what can come out of them. In the past several years, as part of our new Feminist Solutions series, all of which can be found on our website, barnard.edu backslash bcrw, uh, <laughs> new feminist solutions, uh, um, we have had the opportunity to collaborate with Domestic Workers United and the National Domestic Workers Association. <laughs> with the National Women's Foundation on their Reproductive Justice Project, with Queers for Economic Justice, most recently on the Desiring Change Project, and our newest collaboration, which we have just begun this fall, literally a few weeks ago, is with Barnard alumna Sydney L. Mosley, who is a dancer here in Harlem, and she has inaugurated a new program of alumni fellows at the center as well. So she'll be talking about what she hopes to come out of this and what she believes is possible by bringing the academy and activism together. She was in dance and Africana studies major at, at Barnard, and a, a, an excellent combination. I'm, I, we talked about dance last week, earlier this week too, so I'm an emissary now for the dance department and always have been for Africana Studies. Um, so what I'm going to do is just introduce the entire panel in the order that they're going to speak, and I'm going to have to cite cut their biographies because they are so long and distinguished, each and every one of them. Um, and then they will speak for about 10 minutes apiece about their ideas, about um, the work that their organization does, and about their ideas about how collaborating with the um, with academic institutions can work and what it can be good for, and then we're going to open it up and have some conversation. So, um, we decided to uh, go in the following order. First will be Aijin Pu. Aijin has been organizing immigrant women workers in New York since 1996, where she started as the Women Workers Project Organizer at Cobb, organizing Asian communities, and she spoke for us the first time when she was still working at Cobb. In 2000, she helped to start Domestic Workers United, an organization of nannies, housekeepers, and caregivers for the elderly in New York, organizing for power, respect, fair labor standards, and to help build the social justice movement. DWU led the way to the passage of the first domestic workers' rights bill in 2007 in the United States of America, which was in New York State. Um, this bill um, um, extends basic labor protections to over 200,000 domestic workers um, in New York State. And in April 2010, Ijin became director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Um, she sits on many boards. They almost all sit on many, many boards, except for Sydney, who is about to sit on many, many boards right after she speaks here. Um, and so I'm not going to list off all the boards. So just many boards follow. Um, and Ajin is just an amazing organizer, working with um, DWU. I, I myself have learned so much about organizing, so I look forward to hearing from her. Following Ajin will be Sydney L. Mosley, who is um, from the Barnard class of 2011, where she was a dance and Africana studies major. 2007. Oh, it is 2011 now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was only yesterday that Sydney worked. It <laughs> was a student here. <laughs> and somehow she had the time to get an MFA in between now and then. All right, um, and she's also an alumni fellow at the Barnard Center for Research on Women. She has earned, in a very brief period of time, an MFA in dance with an emphasis on choreography from the University of Iowa in 2009. 
She currently presents her choreography with her Harlem-based company, Sydney L. Mosley, Mosley Dances, with works that seek to actively engage the audience's physical and emotional senses with dance performance in addition to involving audiences in the artistic process. Her work has notably been presented in the Chen Dance Center New, Step, New Steps program for emerging artists, the Figment Festival on Governor's Island, Chore Object Photography in Bushwick, Brooklyn, and as part of the New York Foundation for the Arts Boot Camp Arts Festival at Surreal Estate, and also at the Shermerhorn Theater. Sydney currently performs with In Spirit, an all-female collaborative dance company, and is dance faculty for the Dream Yard Preparatory School and Grovesner House YWCA, YMCA. I turn all M's into W's. <laughs> Sydney is also a freelance writer and blogger, um, and um, her most recent writing has appeared in Dance Magazine. Following Sydney will be Amber Hollibaugh, with whom I've had the great pleasure of working since I came to the Barnard Center for Research on Women in the year 2000. Um, and every time I introduce her, I say, I love Amber Hollibaugh. Why wouldn't you? Um, Amber Hollibaugh is the Interim Executive Director of Queers for Economic Justice, or QEJ. Um, and she has also held many important jobs in what I will simply call, as we used to, the movement. And, and I will list just a few of them. She's been chief officer of Elder and LBTI Women's Services at Howard Brown Health Center in Chicago, senior strategist for the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, director of national initiatives at SAGE, Services and Advocacy for GLBT Elders, she spent seven years at the Gay Men's Health Crisis as director of the Lesbian AIDS Project and subsequently as the National Director of Women's Services. And prior to that, she had been the Director of Education for the New York Commission on Human Rights AIDS Division. More than any single job, though, Amber is a well-known activist, artist, public intellectual, and community organizer. She was a founding member for Queers for Economic Justice and currently sits on innumerable boards, including both academic and activist boards. She, is also the found, she was also the founding director of the Lesbian AIDS Project, of the, gay man, in, the project of the Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York City. She was a recipient of the Susan B. Love Award for Outstanding Achievement in Women's Health, and is the author of a book that's taught in many classrooms, including my own, My Dangerous Desires, A Queer Girl Dreaming Her Way Home. And she was the director and co-producer of The Heart of the Matter, a documentary film focusing on women's sexuality, denial, and risk for HIV and AIDS. The film won the 1994 Sundance Film Festival Freedom of Expression Award and premiered on PBS's, in PBS's prestigious POV film series. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Ana Overa, who um, became the president and CEO of the New York Women's Foundation in February of 2006 on the eve of its 20th anniversary. And I don't envy her that because you can see anniversaries are a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> in three and a half years of honest leadership at NYWF, the foundation has grown in several dimensions, sponsoring landmark research reports, increasing the foundation's visibility and public presence in New York City, and dramatically increasing revenue and fundraising, putting the foundation on track to achieve a $5 million um, goal in grant making in its 25th year in 2012. Anna has worked in the health and human services field for over 22 years, developing programs for vulnerable populations throughout New York City. She served as the first woman and Latina executive director of Gay Men's Health Crisis for over seven years. Apparently, it's biblical over there at GMHC, and everyone must stay for seven years. <laughs> And she was a member of the New York City HIV Planning Council and appointed by Mayor Bloomberg to the New York City Commission on AIDS in 2004. She served on the HIV Advisory Board to the Administration of Children's Surfaces and was just named by Mayor Bloomberg to chair the New York City Commission for LGBTQ Runaway and Homeless Youth. She's co-chair of the Board of the Women's Funding Network and many other boards. In 2005, Anna was profiled in Newsweek as America's Best, a series highlighting ordinary individuals using their extraordinary vision on behalf of others. Her awards also include the Mutual Welfare League Certificate, the Liberty Award, Community Service Award, the Rosie Perez Fuerza um, Award, and the Master's Award um, from the Association of Women Business Owners. Ana was born and raised in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and resides in Manhattan. She has an MA in medical anthropology from the New School for Social Research and is a licensed acupuncturist, which I will need on Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, Ai Jin Poo.
Good afternoon. How's everybody feeling? I think we should start by giving a huge happy birthday round of applause to the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Forty years, and thanks so much, Janet, for your incredible leadership. It really is truly amazing. So let's give her a round of applause. So I sometimes like to say that I was a Barnard grad, but I really wasn't. <laughs> I was a wannabe Barnard grad. I was a Columbia Women's Studies major. Always meant to be on this side of Broadway, but you know, that was as close as I could get. But I was here most of the time in classes. Um, so I consider myself an honorary Barnard grad. Okay, good. Um, and it's particularly meaningful for me as somebody who is a very proud feminist and a women's studies major um, to and now working, uh, organizing immigrant women of color around the country to continue to have this relationship with the Barnard Center for Research on Women. And not only is it a relationship that just keeps growing in meaning, but it keeps growing in its impact and its significance, and it's really serving to help grow this movement of domestic workers that's now expanding into a movement to transform care in this country for all of us. And I'm gonna tell that story. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I am the director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which is an alliance of 35 local organizations of nannies, housekeepers, and caregivers for the elderly in 19 cities and 11 states around the country. Yes, very exciting. Um, and so some of you may have heard of Domestic Workers United here in New York, um, but there are so many organizations like that around the country, and we're all working together in one alliance, in one movement. And for most of the last 15 years, the work of building this organizing has been very slow and incremental, worker by worker, case by case, meeting by meeting, and um, over the last 10 years, these organizations have started to flourish. And they've flourished because of the support of many of you in this room who volunteered and organized, and um, with the support of uh, resources like here at the Barnard Center for Research on Women, which has housed many pivotal meetings for us, um, and the support of the New York Women's Foundation that has supported every one of the domestic worker organizations in New York. So this has been a movement movement <laughs> for, from the inception. And I think that that's really important because um, particularly in this conversation about the role of these collaborations, it really is about how do we bring the best of who all of us are to serve a greater purpose and to build, a broader, build towards a broader vision. And there's a role for each and every one of us and each and every institution that we're a part of. And, um, and in these movements and in these campaigns, you see incredible transformation, transformation of the, of the systems, of laws, of policies, but also of um, academics and of uh, schools of thought and of, of ways of thinking. And I'm really excited because we're in this breakthrough moment where we've got a victory under our belt here in New York um, that Janet talked about. We're on the cusp of a victory in California. We've been fighting for a California Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. And there's four other states, Maryland, Illinois, um, Massachusetts, and Washington State that are getting ready um, for these campaigns and to build movements like this. But I'm particularly excited to share with you about our new national campaign um, because it really evolved out of this notion that if you put a gender lens on the world, not only do you see the world more clearly, but you also see the realm of possibilities for strategy more clearly and more fully. And this is the thing that people don't really understand, is like there's a gender critique, but actually what that allows you when you put that lens on is to see this whole other dimension of truth and a whole other dimension of strategy. 
And we've really counted on our partners within the academy to help us put that lens on the world. So here's a concrete example. After we started the National Domestic Workers Alliance in 2007, we came here to Barnard for our very first Congress in 2008 that was host co-hosted by us and the Center for Research on Women. We had 50 domestic workers from around the country meeting, talking, sharing, and what they said was, you know, we really need some training in elder care. I was hired as a housekeeper, but my employer asked me to take care of their mother with Alzheimer's, and I don't know how to do that. I want some training in how to do that. And then somebody else said, that's interesting because my employer just asked me to take care of their grandmother who has Parkinson's. And then these stories about more and more people getting pulled into elder care started coming up. And we thought, that's fascinating, right? Um, and we thought, what is going on here? Because where most of our members were nannies and housekeepers. They weren't hired as elder caregivers. And so together with our partners in the, in the academy, we started putting a gender lens on this question. And what we realized was that domestic workers are actually sitting at the center of a major demographic shift that's happening in this country that's not just about the fact that we are becoming a majority minority country, which we are, but it's also about a generational demographic shift where because of advances in medicine, right, people are living longer. And this year is the first year of what they call the age wave where people are turning 65 at a rate of every eight seconds. 10,000 people per day, four million people per year are turning 65 in this country. So what that means is that we're going to be aging. <laughs> and there's, that's what was happening. Our members were getting pulled into the enormous gap that exists between the infrastructure for care that we have in this country and the need for care that we actually have that's just going to continue to skyrocket. So we started talking to women's groups. We started talking to senior groups. SAGE was one of the first groups we talked to. Um, we started talking to disability rights groups and, what we, and home care unions. And what we realized was that there's a crisis across the board. Whether you're a caregiver, a care worker, you're not making enough money to support your family. You're not making enough money to provide for your health care. If you're a family member who needs to hire a caregiver, you're, in, you're stuck, and you sometimes hear about the sandwich generation. A lot of middle class families are paying for both child care and elder care, and it's an impossible situation. Impossible. And they're struggling with it in isolation, right? And then if you're a senior, your entire safety net is under attack right now. Under attack, aggressive attack. So there is a crisis that affects every single person in this country. And that to me as an organizer is a huge opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so we launched this campaign with all of those partners that we talked to um, called Caring Across Generations. And it's a new campaign to transform care in this country in a way that recognizes everyone's human dignity. It's about, it's about creating two million new jobs in home care. It's about creating quality, dignified jobs, not only for the new jobs that we create, but the jobs that currently exist. It's about training and career ladders to prepare the workforce and offer opportunities for career advancement from domestic work all the way into healthcare, wherever you want to go. These are all skilled forms of work. Um, and it's about creating a new path to citizenship for undocumented workers who are here doing this work. Let's offer training and let's offer a pathway to citizenship. And finally, it's about support for families and individuals who are paying for this care to make it more affordable, tax credits, social security credits for family caregivers, all of these supports that we've needed. 
we need to figure this out together because we're in this together. So I want to show you um, a video that kind of captures the different stories that we're trying to capture here. But I want to say that it, it's partnerships like what we have with the Barnard Center for Research on Women, like what we have with groups like SAGE and QEJ, like what we have with the New York Women's Foundation. It's going to take all of us to meet the challenge of our time. And I think that this collaborative conversation is just one of those seeds. These are, this is absolutely the time that we need to be having that conversation. And we need to be thinking together about how we build these movements that can really win the change that we know we deserve. Um, so here is a video that talks about caring across generations. And I really hope that you all will help us build this movement. My name is Kimmy Lee, and I live in Oakland, California. I was living in Los Angeles, and I was pregnant with this one here. And I had the baby, and my mom came down to visit. And after about two days of visiting, I had a, a stroke. She did have health care. She had coverage. She was still under the COBRA from her previous employer that she had worked for for 25 years, right? And she was a union member and everything. I think it was about $450,000 worth of bills that they were trying to get from my parents. And it was only because my sister was able to navigate that for a year, like fighting with them. If my parents didn't have my sister or I helping, they would have lost their house, they would have lost everything from this, this incident. I came to this work in 2005 when I lost my job and I needed something to get me through and this was available. There were a lot of people that needed help in their homes and it just worked out perfectly for me to be able to give that assistance. I came to work with Mr. Perry because we were friends and he needed assistance and I didn't have a job and he's like, well, how would you like to come here three days a week? Caring for our elders is very, very important work. It takes special people. You can't do it if you don't like it. My independence is very important to me. I can cook what I want and have what I want. And, and that's important to anybody. I heard that the people who are here in the United States were a lot of time alone. O muchas veces, uh, cuando ya estaban viejitos, ya los hijos o las hijas ya los abandonaban, aunque tuvieran todo lo necesario, tuvieran dinero para sobrevivir, los hijos o las hijas no estaban con ellas. Yo, yo me acuerdo que yo decidí, yo voy a hacer la diferencia. Cuando yo trabaje con esta clase de personas, yo voy a hacer la diferencia. ¿Qué voy a hacer? Ah, me gusta cantar, yo les voy a cantar. My mom, while working overseas, she saved for her retirement. In the economic downturn and the collapse that happened in 2008, that was when the great portion of her retirement got wiped out. So now in the last couple of years, my mom has started to take up some work providing care for elders in her community, shopping for groceries, keeping them company, doing household errands for them. Over the last five to ten years, she's also had a number of minor strokes, which definitely taken a toll. My wife and I and my mom collectively think about what the costs will be when she's going to need greater care. We think about what it means in order to save now for that eventuality, draw down more from her current retirement, or if it is going to require me to take on a different line of work. Dr. Steiner was one of my dear and closest clients. The day that I met him, he was sitting in his den. I asked him if he can walk, and he said yes. And I said, well, as of today, you'll be having your meals in the dining room. And that's where I started the process of bringing him out of the shell that he was slowly putting himself into. 
watching TV and seeing the violence and the things that were happening, he was scared. Another time, I said, well, just walk from one end of the patio to the other. And he did that a couple of times. And I keep on doing that until I got him in his wheelchair. Then soon after that, he even started going to weddings and bar mitzvahs and stuff like that. I think being a part of each other's lives not only make him feel better, it also prolonged his life for six and a half years. Why doesn't the government, why doesn't our system have some type of care that follows you through your life, right? So when you're born, you get some prenatal care, when you're a child, you get some care, and then all the way through until you know your senior years that there's actually a support network. Good people deserve good things, so he's always been good to me, so why wouldn't I go out of my way to be good to him? Tú vas a escuchar la historia de las trabajadoras del hogar y, y tal vez tú vas a querer envolverte en un movimiento donde, donde tu abuelita estuvo trabajando y no tuvo derechos. Tal vez, no se sabe, pero yo quiero que tú sepas toda la historia. I want to thank Ijen for that inspiring start and turn it over to Sydney. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Um, again, my name is Sydney Mosley, and I am absolutely thrilled to be the inaugural alumni fellow with the Barnard Center for Research on Women for the 2011-2012 academic year. Um, <laughs> This fellowship is an opportunity that I sought out to ground my work as an independent dance artist with many, many interests. Um, <laughs> these interests <laughs> lie at the intersections of modern dance, movement in the African diaspora, words, I love words, and feminism. I situate myself also as a Harlem artist, and I situate myself in that arts community by creating and presenting dance uptown, partnering with other Harlem artists and businesses, and focusing my community-based work in the Harlem community. My current creative work, The Window Sex Project, has placed me at the nexus of being a community-based artist, activist, and scholar. The Window Sex Project is a community arts initiative that aims to address and tackle the everyday practice in which women are window shopped, that is, being sexually harassed as you walk on the street. Over the, over the summer, a young woman told me, usually I don't wear makeup. I try to be as plain as possible. Right now I'm wearing a rib tank top and I wouldn't wear that outside, at least not with shorts or earrings. It's really anything extra that would attract attention to my woman form. I try to avoid it. This project is a response to that thinking. It empowers women to be confident in their bodies on a day-to-day -day basis while being strategic about their safety and responses to harassment. The project is occurring in two parts, creative movement workshops for women in Harlem that contribute to an evening-length dance performance in a Harlem art gallery. The workshops which occurred this past summer uh, took place in various up -down, uptown spaces, including the YMCA on the 105th Street, Barnard's campus, and the Harlem School for the Arts. At these workshops, I was able to provide a safe and supportive space for women to come and voice their concerns and share their experiences about street harassment. The women who came to these 
to these workshops were absolutely ready to tell their stories and they were looking for a space where they could share them. They were looking for information on how to deal with things on a day-to-day -day basis and it was an absolutely wonderful opportunity uh, to be able to provide those resources for them. They were also able to feel empowered by sharing a movement experience as a group of women in these particular individual workshops. The participants took place in an African-inspired dance class paired with a yoga or Pilates warm-up, a roundtable discussion with activists working on the issue of street harassment specifically, and then took part in a task-based movement creation exercise that I facilitated. In one of these exercises, I asked participants, what is a particular body part that you think attracts the most attention? And can you create a short movement phrase about that body part? Currently, I'm creating a full evening-length dance work integrating these movement phrases and stories from the Harlem community, seeking to restore agency specifically to those women who participated in the workshops. The Window Sex Project uses our bodies, the object of harassment, and our voices, what is often silenced, as tools to fight back and ebb away at a culture that allows us to be reduced to the sum of our parts the minute we walk out the door each day. Artistically speaking, I've developed a process equally dependent on theory and praxis. Blame it on my interdisciplinary liberal arts education, <laughs> but critical discourse on gender, race, culture, and class is, stimulates my creative process just as much as music, movement, poetry, or prose. It was only natural to me then to seek the resources of an academic institution to enrich my work. This year, I returned to Barnard seeking to fill gaps in my education on feminist theory through auditing a course on black feminisms and browsing books in the library stacks on body politics. This research provided a framework and a way of thinking about this issue of street harassment, an offense that happens daily to any woman in almost any geographical area and for no other reason than the fact that she decided to walk out the door. I wanted to know how is a woman's sexuality perceived based on attributes of body type and skin color? In other words, what do you see when you see me? Further reading helped me situate my choreography and my quest to get women to tell their stories of harassment publicly with the greater plight of feminist struggle and movement. I did not think of myself as an activist before this work, but dancing, the only way I've ever loved to move, is now political. At the same time that I've been filling my head with theoretical ideas, I've been working with the Citizens Committee of New York City, as well as Hollaback NYC, one of the leading activist organizations against street harassment, to collect women's stories and plan how the dance performance can be used for political action. We are video recording individual stories and creating an online video series in a quest to ebb away at street harassment one story at a time. As Holly Curl writes on her, on her website, StopStreetHarassment.org, maybe if more people know how women feel about street harassment and that 80 to 100 percent of women experience it at some point in their lives, it would happen less and there would be less victim blaming. These stories will also become a video montage during the dance work that we plan to invite Harlem community and political leaders to so they can see and hear exactly what is happening on the streets of their constituency. Activist, acti activist academic partnerships are important because it takes the vision of this feminist struggle out of the circles of the educated elite, making it accessible and commonplace amongst those who are acting and moving toward change based on their everyday lived experiences. Academia can archive feminist history and analyze contemporary movements, providing a foundation for feminist activism. In my case, Barnard is the physical site rich with resources to research, create, and hold community events. In return, at this very moment, I'm bringing my choreography and research to the campus engaging students and faculty alike with real-world feminism. <laughs> that activism that comes from really just being who I am, a young black woman living in Harlem, making a career out of dancing, recognizing a need for change, and then making a move toward it. One very specific goal that I have this year with my fellowship is to create a codified curriculum out of the Window Sex Project that could be implemented in any community, anywhere, uh, as a mode for women to work through their experiences of harassment and assault. 
As one community participant remarked to me, you have to change culture with culture. So with support of Barnard, I will create this curriculum and it will provide an opportunity for people to use their bodies in any way that they see fit to create a work that responds to the experiences that they had. Barnard is an institution where young women critically analyze their surroundings, advocate for change, and manifest their ideas into reality. As a student, I acquired these tools, and as an alumna, I use them in my everyday work and practice. My alliance with Barnard allows me to be part of that campus fabric, serving the academic community that has given me the confidence and wherewithal to pursue an artistic life in New York City. This artistic life is rooted in community the modern dance community, the Harlem community, and now the Barnard community. The only New York City academic institution equipped and geographically situated to engage with my work in modern dance through the lens of race and gender in Harlem. It's my aim as an artist to continue to involve these communities in my artistic process, fostering discourses and taking part of those discourses that already exist to facilitate a critical awareness of our lived experiences in these communities and, may, and hopefully we'll be able to change those communities for the better. I know I've been doing public speaking for a lot of years, but I have to say that there is never a time that it doesn't really scare me before I start, um, <laughs> which I've now decided is a positive thing, because if I was just saying the same thing over and over, you would be bored, um, and I would be repeating myself. Not a good thing. So um, I want to first say that I'm incredibly honored to have been asked to participate on this panel um, with the women that are sitting at this table and all the work that that represents. Um, and even more importantly to me, uh, to be continuing my engagement with the Barnard Center for Research on Women, which has been going on since the 80s, um, and which I'm very proud of, because I think that in a moment of enormous attacks against many institutions, including education systems, the privatization and capitalization of education, the enormous um, dissembling, you know, taking apart of public education and private institutions having to capitalize in different kinds of ways to stay in existence, the marker of Barnard Center uh, for Research on Women's ongoing commitment to activism is incredibly important because the work of social change is even more dramatic at this moment, at this point in time, even more critical to bring feminism and activism in an integrated way to address what it is that we all struggle with and see happening around us. And I think often creates a sense of enormous um, defeat and fear. And I say that for myself. I can barely stand to read the newspaper, actually, because there just is not one, it's one story after another story after another story of all the things that are happening um, that, that break my heart. Um, and I just want to mark one thing here because in the many things that are difficult, I want to remember Troy Davis and, and say that my being here is part of my commitment to the resistance against that kind of racism, that kind of executing of a black man in Georgia and of my commitment, my ongoing commitment um, to make a world where that's impossible to happen. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think it's an accident that this conference recognizes the Barnard Center for Research on Women bringing together activism and scholarship. That is its history. It's not its past, it's its current and its future. And I think that it really is important to see the value of that at a moment when many of us feel that we're, we're caught in defensive battles that we never thought we'd be fighting again for things that are tiny and not at all what we need, but we're trying to hold on to whatever it is that still exists in the social safety net, not even able to imagine um, asking new questions and creating new visions of what it is that needs to happen. The Barnard Center for Research on Women and its partnerships is one of the few places that allows the possibility that I think we reflect of asking new questions and thinking in new ways about how to generate feminism in this generation at this moment in time with that history but going forward in innovative ways. I think it's not an accident that the Barnard Center for Research on Women was born out of the activism that created women's liberation, that identified the importance of the voices of women um, in creating social justice, and that asked about a radical perspective in the way we understood the world. To me, that's the incredible gift of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and it's the gift of the partnership that we've had, that QEJ has had, and that Desiring Change, the project, has had. I want to say a couple of things about QEJ, and then I want to describe for you this project, because I don't think it's an accident that it's an ongoing project here. This is one of the few places that I think is the right fit for the work that we're talking about when we're talking about desiring change. QEJ, of which I'm the interim executive director, is one of the few organizations in the United States that insists that the intersection of class, race, sexual orientation, and gender identity cannot be positioned against each other in order to understand who's queer. that when you're talking about the impact of, of the recession, when you're talking about elder care, when you're talking about workplace environments, when you're talking about immigrant workers, when you're talking about HIV status, you're talking about queer people. And we are trying to figure out over and over again how to make visible what we know to be true, which is that the majority of queer people are in communities of color, poor communities, and working class communities, and are part of the struggle that's represented in this work and broader work that, but that where we often disappear, where it often isn't seen. So QEJ is one of the few LGBT, it's the only LGBTQ organization that works in shelter systems <laughs> with LGBTQ people that are in those shelter systems. Um, we created something called the Beyond Same-Sex Marriage Statement. Um, in our intentionality to actually reframe the way that that question is asked so that the identity-driven idea of marriage and queer people stops identifying and defining a movement. We've created a LGBTQ shelter writers group, and the newest work that we're doing is something called Queer Survival Economies, which is trying to use a model like the Excluded Workers Congress to identify a targeted group of workers that are both invisible and are unprotected in the workplace. That's QEJ, and we're in partnership through the Desiring Change Project. Um, and that project is older and came to QEJ in the last few years because it was work that I had been doing. I came to Janet at a meeting of feminist academics with an outline about what I was thinking about that I couldn't find a place to house. 
It was a question of why desire, why the erotic, why sexuality always disappeared in the way that we create and build social justice and intellectual activities, unless it's something specific to reproductive justice, LGBT rights, or HIV and AIDS. But as, a, as an engine of social justice, the erotic is never seen as a critical component of how we do our work. And it is a project that then tries to ask this question. If, even with intentionality, you're doing intersectional work around class, race, sexuality, sexual orientation, and gender, why does desire disappear? Why is it that we can't keep it in the mix as we try to move social justice work and build social justice theory? And if it disappears, even when people intend it to be there, is there another question we need to ask, which is simply, are we using the wrong model to organize because we can't answer this question and we can't afford to experiment because deliverables are not attached to desire? Desiring change began as a, con a set of convenings and has, ha has worked over many years to try and bring together people who had similar concerns doing work in remarkably different places. People doing farm worker organizing, people doing healthcare organizing, people doing immigrant rights organizing, people doing uh, reproductive justice work, all began to gather to try and ask the same question. We all think this is important. Why is it we can't hold it in place? Why is it that desire ends up being the thing that disappears from the way that we understand the project of what we move forward? And what we also are asking, and I think it's really an essential question for all of us doing social justice work, is why does it not matter around pleasure and joy? How do you build a movement that expresses the hope for a different world if you don't claim one of the possibilities of where that joy resides? Not whether it's queer, but whether it's in the body of the people that we're working with day in and day out in the academy, in our social justice work, in the way that we're imagining the possibility of a transformed world. It has to be at the core of what it is we speak to in order to make it possible for people to join us. People don't just join because of the bad news. <laughs> Though it helps. You don't have to be quite as, you know, have to go on as long. Uh, people know. Um, but the, the question of how you build social justice movements, how you build intellectual activities that frame the possibility of thinking through desire has become something targeted by the right and denied by most of the social justice movements that now exist. They're terrified in different ways because they'll offend either somebody that is in the academy that has control over their lives or in their funding world where they're terrified that they'll be targeted and not refunded if they ask those questions, it means that the way that this is engaged is harder and harder to hold on to. Activism has to engage with the possibility of passion and vision in order to build a movement for justice and liberation. If our vision is built on more than rage, if our vision is built on more than rage against oppressions we name, then it needs to embody those fragile, powerful components that make us human. It matters deeply that we claim the erotic, that we assert desire as a part of the centerpiece of freedom 
for, for now and for a better world. Finally, it is about all of us in all the ways we are capable of being. Thank you. Wow. Now, I wanted to go last, you know, because I think philanthropy should always follow, you know, but I just got myself the hardest job because, you know, this has just progressed and there is no way that I can, um, can follow these shoes that keep enlarging here as everyone speaks. But um, first of all, let me thank you, Janet, for your stellar leadership of the Barnard Center for Research and Women. Even though I, I am in philanthropy and in a community kind of foundation, that means we don't have like a big endowment and I have to fundraise. We believe that leadership is much more difficult to get than money. So I say that. I say that with profound seriousness, but also because I, uh, when I am thinking about your leadership, that's what it means to us. Um, so, um, and, and Barnard, you know, Amber spoke so eloquently about the importance, the history of the Barnard Center of Research of Women. There's nothing I can add to that other than to say that it's a very generous center, it's a very generous partner to, um, to communities in New York City and um, has been um, not just able to preserve, but I think it has been able to increase its connection with uh, what I'm gonna say, an activist, academic kind of posture. And, and that is very much due, I think, um, to your leadership, Janet, and the team of folks that you work with. So I just wanted to say that because um, uh, the foundation had the great um, opportunity to benefit from that generosity by actually linking um, a group of our um, incredible grantee partners working on reproductive justice and they had their work uplifted and their work um, taken to another dimension because of the Barnard Center Research on Women. And um, we, we really want to thank you and we really want to congratulate Barnard for being smart enough to continue <laughs> to fund the center and to continue to have the center because you know that's really important. I didn't um, put her up to that. Yeah, no, 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 this is like, um, this is another thing that people doing philanthropy can do. We can, we can say what we think because supposedly we have a little money, you know? <laughs> it's very funny. So anyway, <laughs> it really is. But um, I also wanted to just say that we are, you know, I'm just so honored to, to, to be sitting where I am this afternoon because we, um, you know, Amber and QUJ, and IGEN and Domestic Workers United and now the National Alliance, we had the opportunity to be, and we are grateful that we were smart enough to know to fund them, to know <laughs> to partner with them. And, um, and that's really a challenge for philanthropists, is to keep our eyes and our values clear so we don't miss the incredible opportunities that are out there in the world. And Sydney, we should talk about holler back. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> We should talk about that. Um, so um, the foundation is, a, we are not like your regular foundation. When you think about philanthropy, what do you think about? Money. Money. You think about what, like maybe Bill Gates, right? You think about very, very wealthy people, usually white males, and um, you don't think about something that occurs in the lives of regular people people like us because we say, you know, to make a difference with money, you have to have a lot of it. So uh, that we are, uh, we want to tell you that that's not the only way that one makes a difference with money. We operate, um, we are, it's called a public foundation. A public foundation doesn't have like a corporation or a family or an individual that put a lot of money aside in something called an endowment and then every year the foundation gives out usually about 5%, uh, give or take a little bit depending on the foundation, gives out that in grants. That's a particular kind of an endowed foundation. 
uh, we were born in a, in a, in a philanthropic movement that uh, was very much about, you know, this country has had the community philanthropy movement, and then um, as part of it, as a little offshoot of that, of that, the women's funding movement. And that's about now 35 years old, I would say, around that time. And um, it was the idea that women um, have been very underinvested. That's no news for any of us. But that uh, th from the philanthropic sector, that investment needed to begin to be um, organized against and a response needed to be created. So women's funds have been created and continue to be created throughout the globe. There's about uh, 200 and something funds these days. And um, right now, the majority um, is in the US, but the biggest growth is outside the US of new women's funds. So we have incredible funds like the African Women Development Fund. We have you know, a great fund in Brazil called ELAS. We have Latin American, Central American funds. We have funds, you know, Mama Cash in um, Amsterdam. It's really just a very, very um, big universe. They have a strong women's fund in Australia as well. And we are just in New York City. We're just in the five boroughs. And uh, we're, we are next year is the other anniversary. You know, next year is the 25th anniversary of the foundation, which I think that's something about anniversaries that we really need to, it's, it's a marking time, right? It's, it's, it's not an end. It's just a, a, a thing we pass through. But... I think he speaks to something that um, I heard in, in Amber's um, uh, comments about resilience. It's really important for us to, to continue to build resilience. The change that we're looking for, uh, unfortunately, doesn't happen as fast as we would like it to happen yet. But it's important to build resilience. So the foundation is a cross-cultural alliance and that means that we truly, this is in the mission of the foundation, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to work there, frankly, is because most of the time you fight to get uh, things like that in institutions, in not-for-profits. It really helps when that is in the mission of an organization because you don't have to fight, to, you, have to, you have to make it continue to happen, but you're not fighting against it. The other thing that we profoundly believe in, and this is about women's funds in general, but we really believe in, is that problems and solutions are found in the same place. And what that means, among many things, is that uh, women are agents of solutions, that uh, communities of color, underinvested communities, are agents, authors of their own solutions as well. That the difference between givers and doers is really a fake difference that philanthropy has existed ad infinitum in communities of color, in communities with less high net worth individuals, etc. That the construct of philanthropy initiated in this country very much as a reflection of an incredible disparity between the wealthy and the poor and the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. So that concept has evolved, and there is a large group of foundations that are part of something called social justice philanthropy. Women's funds is certainly the New York Women's Foundation. We see ourselves as part of that bigger movement. And what that means is that we invest, we fund social change, or leaders, organizations, movements. That's what that means. My job, and I really mean that, you know, please don't think that uh, an ED job, a CEO job, is that you get to decide everything. Mm -hmm. You just, you, ha you get to fundraise. That's what you do. Yeah. Uh, but that's, a, yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, my job is to, in a very, very tiny way, in New York City, which is a very resource, um, resourced city. We are not a resource poor environment. It's really important that we understand that. We're not a resource poor environment. The distribution of wealth is a mess, you know. <laughs> it's the biggest gap. Manhattan has the biggest gap between um, incomes in the country, right here in this borough where we are. So just to say that we don't suffer from lack of wealth. What we suffer from is the distribution 
and the prioritization of what happens with those resources. So in this kind of context, it's really important that philanthropy be very active to seek to correct that. We don't think we can correct that through philanthropy. We're just saying that philanthropic efforts need to aim towards correcting that. So um, we, at the New York Men's Foundation, we are not, we gi we're giving out now more money than we ever gave on a yearly basis. We are, this year, $4 million. $4 million. We, and next year's our 25th, we will get to the $5 million. That's, uh, we, that's the goal. Uh, and that means that we're able to be partners with about 67 organizations in New York City. And that's really important because um, Aijen was talking about movement and lives movement and is movement and is a leader in a movement. Movements build communities and strengthen communities. But stronger communities build stronger movements, right? It's kind of a, a together thing that way. So what we are doing is investing in strengthening the institutions and the leaders in communities so they can continue to build their solutions where, they are, where their problems are. Yes? yes. That's the idea. Yes. So um, over this 24 years, we, we are giving about 24 million next year because of the five, we're gonna go to 29. We're very happy about that. And why are we interested in that? Because, and I wanted to, to connect with what Amber was saying a little bit, and it, we feel that there's an incredible urgency in accelerating the, the degree, the quantity, and the depth of our responses. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about social change responses, social justice responses. I'm talking about community responses. Many times, you know, the issue of opening the newspaper. If you opened the newspaper yesterday, at least in the New York Times, I don't know in the others, there was an article about poverty in New York City. Did anybody read that thing? Yeah. Okay. The poverty in New York City increased at a higher rate than it increased in other cities that also have high poverty. So uh, in New York City, um, one out of four women and girls lives in poverty. One out of four. And in New York, as in general, one out of five. So in our case, there is a completely, uh, I'm going to say, unacceptable, but also, materially speaking, unnecessary situation. And um, so the question is, what can we do collectively that we can accelerate solutions? You know, that we can get to that famous tipping point. Um, in some ways, this is my reframing of what I think is going on, is that I actually think that the structures that we've been seeking to change are falling apart quite fast. Mm -hmm. They're falling apart quite fast. The, the, the challenge that, that we feel at the foundation is that because it's going very fast, um, our responses need to be really fast. Mm -hmm. they, and it's hard to get there. Is this making any sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. So when, when the economic system is pretty much like, you know, be getting CPR every other day, and it's not working, we need to be able to have, just as an example, some um, doable proposals about a rearrangement of economic forces that we can begin to go to. So, but the speed in which those things need to be ready, you know, that kind of thought leadership, that kind of solution-based um, opportunities that need to be communicated, magnified, is a very challenging thing for us. So we think that um, it's really important to increase, and not just from us, because for us it's just a million dollars more than I can get for this next year, but philanthropists in general, that it is the time to invest in these incredible uh, solutions, movements. You heard about two, just in, in two moments, and you heard about Sydney's work and how that is growing into a movement, that it's really important to invest in that because, uh, yes, things are, are, are bad, but, but, but every crisis is an opportunity. Every crisis is an opportunity. It's just that what it takes is really a lot. I always wondered, you know, what it, what it, when I was studying history, 
what, what it must have felt like, you know, to live during like the plague, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, that kind of thing. I always felt, you know, studying and see, what would he, what, what, how did people feel they could do something about it or not, you know? And I, when systems were crum crumbling, you know, how did they create the new, you know? What was it like living in that kind of place? And, um, and I think, you know, that that's totally where we are. We know that. So the birth of the new. So, you know, it's, it's like this birthing thing. I've never had children, so there are others that are expert on that. But, but this is really like we got to... We got to quicken the midwifery of the new here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got to do that. So that's where I think that partnerships are very important with academia. I think partnerships are very important with academia because they permit um, uh, a production of knowledge. They permit uh, bringing together of social actors and political actors that usually don't come together around a shared goal and a shared solution. Mm -hmm. I do think that it's really important for us to, uh, isn't it good that at least there's an admission that there's, there's increasing poverty in New York City? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, so what do we do with it, right? What do we do with it? And what, are, what do we want to propose to change that? And I mean in very practical ways. In the United States, it's not the case everywhere in the world, but in the United States, political change is incremental. Traditionally, it has been incremental. So to work with incremental change, we need to be able to be, able to be very deep in our analysis, not all of us about everything, but each of us in our part. And we need to be able to be very connected with that depth into the other issues. When we are, when we, we are funders, you know, we can fund a study, we can fund a knowledge production thing for our grantee partners, but that's not our expertise. Grantee partners are activists, are leaders, are doers, are first responders. That's not their particular expertise. But it's that authentic relationship between kind of the, the activist academics, you know, uh, such as in the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and those other partners. And our role is to come to fund a foundation like ours. But it is that that we think can help accelerate. So we would like, we're not ready, but we would like, and, and I, we will get ready, to have had a series of articles, a series of interviews that we could do. I was discussing this today at the foundation, you know. What are the local solutions around, um, you know, econo building economic security and economic justice that we can highlight? What are the next data points that we will connect the dots and, and be able to continue that conversation in a way that we direct it more? So the partnership with academia in, in our opinion, is very important in that regard. It's also very important because um, there's an access to the realm of ideas and to the realm of policy that usually funders don't, not even funders have that. Certainly folks that are day in and day out, not only doing work, but worrying about how they're gonna support their work financially, cannot do. And most importantly, the, that, that kind of partnership permits us to correct course. It's really important for us to be able to be most efficient in effecting the change that we want to effect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So as this volatile environment shifts, you know, it's really important for us to be able to have that kind of partner that steps back and steps in and gives us a bigger perspective. That is just to say that at the end of the day, we need to find faster ways to get more and more of us engaged. Uh, we do think that um, New Yorkers, we are um, very able to get to a le level of mobilization around these issues in New York City that uh, we haven't been able to do before. In the recent past, have done in a more far away past, but it's time to do it again. So we want to thank Barnard for being such an activist thought leader in New York City and for knowing that it's through those partnerships that keeps us all moving faster. Thank you.
Well, I think that pretty well covered the ground, but um, we do have some time for conversation. Uh, for uh, questions, comments, uh, anything that you would like to add for this for a few minutes here. All right, um, Anna, are you prepared? Should we, can we go in reverse order this time? And you go first, and sure. then we'll go um, Anna, Amber, Sydney, Ijen. So, so I think the thing that I'm um, better able to say something about is the funding system question and the issue of competition yeah. and scarcity, resources, abundance, all this stuff. So um, a couple of things, you know, that um, the, the philanthropic, let's talk about funding there's the role of philanthropy and there's the role of the state. Um, philanthropy is uh, typically um, either is a catalytic funder and in some cases when they are very large foundations, they, they make multi-year commitments, you know, things like that. But typically philanthropy, um, you know, it's kind of a funky thing because um, the accountability of foundations is, is really depending on, like I'm accountable, we are accountable to the board, but we're also accountable to all the funders. And you know how many funders we have? Like 5,000, every single person. And we have donors from $1 to a million dollars because it's a democratic thing. We are accountable that we invest our monies in the community of New York. And by the way, we do it through volunteers in a participatory system. If you ever want to participate in that, please check our website. You know, it's that kind of who gives, you also direct the funds. But in foundations in general, they have their board, they have their mission. There's not a, and they will prioritize and operate according to that. Are you there with me? So if it's a, if it's a family foundation that has an interest in children, just to connect the two things, then they will direct. But there's not a, like a macro system of accountability that, that people respond to, that institutions respond to. Um, the issue of mitigating competition, the issue of fostering collaboration, it really depends on the values of the funders. It really depends on what kind of change funders are trying to effect. Let me just tell you that many funders believe that they have the solution. And what they're looking for is just people to do the programs the way they want. That's not us. That's why I was emphasizing to you the issue of problems and solutions are found in the same place. That's a different proposition. But most of the funders that you were referring to it's a different approach, you know? So let me tell you what the hope is on this, is that within philanthropy, there's a bunch of folks like us that are working to shift those things, to influence the voice of grantee partners, the, to mitigate the power of inequality of money that way. But the last comment is that at the end of the day, fundamental, um, services and opportunities that we consider them to be human rights, they need to be funded and provided by the state. By the state, I mean federal government, state government, city government, depending on what it is, because the amounts that we're talking about, philanthropy cannot sustain that. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? So I'm talking about housing, I'm talking about healthcare, I'm talking about food, I'm talking about transportation, I'm talking about school, education, you know, that kind of thing. Those kinds of things, are in a, they are rights. You know, they are uh, rights that the state needs to, in our opinion, ensure. I hope that helps a little bit yes. with that. Um, I want to speak to the Wall Street action. I think it's really an interesting action, and I think it's an action that's been very, uh, and the organizing around it has been very difficult to connect to. 
Um, the organizers themselves are not well funded. It's been difficult to try and figure out how to participate. And so I know from QEJ's side, at least, we've been trying to figure out what we could do, how we could be more of a part of it. Um, but it's difficult when people are in the midst of an action to also then hook in when the police are having such an incredible building, such an incredible wall that stops you from literally, you know, in getting involved in the ways that they don't want, um, I think, social justice work to take off. One of the things that we've been thinking about at QEJ is how to make it more visible amongst the communities that we're connected to. That it's not simply a matter of like QEJ joining something, it's about actually letting people know, because the coverage has actually been awful um, relative to the enormous um, impact of the organizing. And the ability to spread the word can't depend on, you know, Roseanne Carr and Michael Moore and Rachel Maddow. I mean, it really, it, we've all got to then plug in to make that kind of organizing more visible when those actions happen. Um, and so I think, it, you know, I'm really glad that you brought it up. And I think that there's a lot more that can be done at the moment in all our organizations to try and figure out how to bring more people there and how to bring more visibility to it. Because it really ties to all the work that each one of us on this panel are talking about. Excellent. Sydney. Um, I just want to say as a closing remark that um, I'm very honored and humbled to be on this panel with you all um, because I'm learning so much just sitting here. Um, one thing that I did want to address, uh, someone made the comment earlier of how do we generate feminism in this uh, generation? And I just think about myself and my peers um, and this idea of what activism is. And I think it was you that said activism is vision and passion. And well, somebody on this side would say, vision and passion is Amber, yes. <laughs> but it, it is exactly that thing that is going to fuel uh, feminism and real feminist action, I think, amongst our generation. So I just wanted to, um, to say that. Um, and that is all. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Okay, uh, on the Occupy Wall Street actions, I think we're in this really unique moment where we can actually build a very robust corporate accountability movement in this country. People are angry. People are really angry. Um, so it's both supporting those actions but figuring out what a really robust corporate accountability movement looks like. And um, I think there's a, there's a campaign called The New Bottom Line that uh, lots of community organizations are starting to get involved in that's planning a series of direct actions um, on banks, on um, big bad corporate actors, um, and also targeting members of the Super Committee of Congress who are going to be trying to figure out how they cut $1.5 trillion from the budget. And, I'll tell you what, <laughs> I think I know where those cuts are going to end up landing. And so there's a moment right now, and people are ready to take action. So I want to encourage people to look into the new bottom line campaign, National People's Action is the organization, or one of the organizations that's anchoring it. Um, in terms of what students can do on domestic workers, I think that Domestic Workers United, you know, for the first three, four years, we didn't have much staff at all, and most of our organizing was done by domestic workers and students, college students, who gave up their time and came and interned with us and basically acted like staff. So there's actually the opportunity for you to get involved in implementing the Bill of Rights, organizing domestic workers if you're interested in it, um, helping domestic workers manage, like learn how to exercise their rights in the workplace. Um, and we're doing this national story collection campaign where we're actually trying to get students, young people, older people, families, everybody to share their story about somebody who's taken care of them or somebody that they take care of and what that relationship means to them. Right? to really talk about how important a part of society this really is, how much a part of the social fabric it is. And so 
there's a storytelling role for every last person in this room, and we're going to actually have cameras going from campus to campus, really trying to get students involved in that level. So the websites, domesticworkers.org, caringacrossgenerations.org, domesticworkersunited.org. Sign up on all those lists, and you'll get tons of opportunities. <laughs> um, and I want the disability rights piece. Um, I just wanted to say the campaign is really supporting protecting Medicaid, but also real Medicaid reform because um, the way the current Medicaid system works doesn't actually serve the people's needs the way that it should. Um, where part of our training is talking about training of workers in consumer directed care, right? Um, that's a big issue in the disability rights community. And we really want to make sure that the home care jobs that we create, that they're actually jobs that people who've been historically underemployed have access to, like people with disabilities, right? Um, so there are all these ways in which we're trying to connect the dots, which is the last point I wanted to make, um, which is that on, on the domestic violence question, it's like, if we continue to organize in silos, we will never have the power that we need to even achieve the demands that exist inside of those silos. Mm -hmm. So we will never transform domestic violence if we don't figure out how we connect domestic violence to economic justice, to immigrant rights, to all of these issues. <laughs> And we'll never address immigrant rights and immigrant justice if we don't figure out how we connect domestic violence. And, and an example of this is we're about to take 30 women leaders from around the country to Atlanta next week to document the human rights abuses of women in the wake of the anti-immigrant legislation that passed in the state of Georgia this year. Um, and the reason is because all of the work that the women's movement did to break the silence around violence against women is undermined completely by these immigration enforcement policies that make people afraid to get help, afraid to access services, afraid to call the police, afraid, right? And it's so these issues are totally connected. They're, they're the same, they live inside of all of us in a very connected way. And that's how we have to organize and that's how we have to build the movement. That is the perfect note to end on, so I want to thank each and every one of our panelists for collaborating with us and for being here today.